clock is ticking on the A's negotiations in Las Vegas. Two sports apparel companies are looking at hefty financial hits, and there could be seismic changes for the NCAA on the horizon. It's Monday, May 22nd. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Later in the episode, we'll hear from ESPN reporter Emily Kaplan on what it's like interviewing a hockey coach in the middle of a game. But first, some news. The Oakland A's have two weeks to strike a deal to fund a new stadium in Las Vegas before the legislative session ends on June 5th. They are now asking for $395 million in public funds, which would probably come from state and county bonds that would then be repaid through taxes generated by the stadium and surrounding area. Late last week, we got a few different reports on how close they were to making that happen. The Las Vegas Review Journal said that Nevada lawmakers had agreed to supply $320 million and that the team was negotiating with Clark County over the last $75 million. The Nevada Independent said that lawmakers actually only want to give out $150 to $195 million, which would leave a $200 million gap. How are we getting two very different numbers here? The answer appears to be in a Fox 5 Las Vegas report, which says that state lawmakers only want to give out $195 million, but the state could compel Clark County to issue a $125 million bond, which would exactly bridge the gap between the two other reports. What we don't know right now is how able and willing is Clark County to cough up that money, and would that be affected by the state compelling them to issue the bond? I just want to take a moment to point out the rapidly shrinking ambitions of A's ownership here. We went from the team being prepared to come up with $12 billion between themselves and other developers to build a new stadium and an entire new neighborhood in Oakland. Then they said they were going to buy 49 acres in Las Vegas to build a stadium plus some other attractions for around $2.5 billion. Now they have dialed that back to a deal where Bally's, which manages the site where they now want to build, will give them nine acres to work with for free and they will build a 30,000 capacity stadium there. Bally's estimates 2.5 million visitors to the stadium annually, which would require them to sell out every home game. So Bally's estimate is just the maximum number it could possibly be. In the next week or two, we are going to find out how motivated each party is to make a deal. If the gap is $75 million, that seems pretty bridgeable, but that's also pretty close to where the A's supposedly were with Oakland when the team pivoted to Vegas. If the gap is more like $200 million, that's obviously a different animal. If we reach June 5th with no deal, Nevada Governor Joe Lombardo can call a special session, but the sense I get is that that is not a desirable outcome, and he would probably only do it if a deal was pretty close. But if things aren't looking good in Vegas, Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao remains ready to deal. Looking elsewhere, Foot Locker saw its stock drop over 27% on Friday after the company posted earnings that came in well below expectations. Nike is vulnerable to at least $530 million in fines for misclassifying contract workers, according to company documents seen by The Guardian. Like many companies, Nike relies on thousands of contract workers. A consulting firm looked at 3,670 contracts and found that around a quarter of them should actually be employment relationships. And Nike isn't the only entity that could be facing this issue. The NCAA might as well. The National Labor Relations Board filed a complaint alleging unfair labor practices by the NCAA, Pac-12, and USC. We're going to save the longer discussion here for another time. But this is a federal labor agency angling to allow college athletes to organize, collectively bargain for benefits, and at some point be classified as employees. If that happens, it will be one of the biggest changes in all of sports in a generation. Up next, I spoke to ESPN reporter Emily Kaplan. We spoke about the NHL playoffs, what it's like being a sideline reporter trying to get good quotes out of a coach in the middle of a game, and the specific advantages and disadvantages to being a woman in a male-dominated field. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash front office.
All right, very excited now to be joined by Emily Kaplan, national NHL reporter for ESPN. Welcome, Emily. Thanks, Owen. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, so let's get to know you a little bit. So you've been in the sports journalism world about 10 years, give or take. Um, what's it been like to forge your path as a woman in sports journalism? Hmm. Loaded question just to start me off. <laughs> you know, I think I'm really blessed because I have in so many ways have a really blessed career. You know, I graduated from Penn State in 2013. I got an internship at Sports Illustrated right out of college that turned into a job, National Football League job covering uh, that. And then that parlayed into this job covering the National Hockey League for ESPN. Um, I've had some really great mentors who have supported me along the way. Um, I do feel, though, in many ways that I'm charting my own path. And some of the things that I do, I don't think people have done before me and just kind of my versatility. You know, I came up as a writer. All I ever wanted to do was be a writer. And so in so many ways, I got my dream job at age 23, being a staff writer at Sports Illustrated. Um, but now I'm doing sideline reporting on TV. I'm working on video features. I do podcasting. I'm still writing for ESPN.com, breaking news when I can. I really feel like that's a full-time job. So I pick and choose my spots when I can be an insider, but trying to assert myself as an authoritative voice. So, um, you know, all of these are just characteristics of my job. I don't necessarily think that me being a woman has played into all of it, but it definitely is um, a characteristic of me and, and part of what I who I am. Yeah, and... Do you feel like you had to to fight harder or just in a different way to get those positions? Or was it you did you feel like it was just a meritocracy? You know, and women broke the barriers in locker rooms in the 70s and 80s. And so the men that I cover now are so conditioned to having women cover them. In a lot of ways, it's just kind of normal for both of us in the normal transaction. That said, there's definitely advantages for me being a woman. You know, I, I do think that in some ways I have been a diversity hire at certain stops that I was at where they were looking for a different voice. And for so long, those voices had been white and male. Um, I do know that when I go into a locker room, the guys tend to remember me more, um, you know, than the many, many any males that are there before me or around me. Um, I feel like sometimes we can connect on a different level. Um, we can have different conversations that maybe the male reporters don't feel comfortable having. Um, but there are disadvantages. You know, I kind of alluded to news breaking. That is completely a relationships business and it's a male's world. And in so many ways, the way this information is, you know, passed along from the sources to the journalists, um, it's, you know, drinking and going out golfing and things where, hey, if I'm drinking with a source at a bar at 11 p.m., people are going to look at me and then, you know, start to wonder the wrong things. Um, you know, I, I have to create certain rules for myself. I don't text guys after certain hours because I don't want them to get certain ideas. So in those ways, I do find it to be a disadvantage. But I also, you know, always try to look for different avenues and different ways that I can create my own network and, um, you know, carve my own path. And in some ways, again, I, I find inefficiency or efficiency and inefficiency. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and is there a particular flavor to all of that in the hockey world? Um, or is it, or do you think those same dynamics would, I mean, of course, some of those same dynamics would be there in, you know, baseball, football, whatever. But yeah, is, does hockey have its own version of all that? Yeah, well, hockey predominantly is white and male, um, Canadian um, as well. Um, and, and definitely the buddies and, and the relationships that were built um, that create front offices. You know, I sometimes find I look around at like a board of governors meeting or GM meeting and being like, not one person here has any similarities to me or my path and how I got here. And, you know, I think in some ways that I think those men just don't really know what to do with me. They don't really know how to talk to me. They're, they're kind of scared of me, maybe a bit more hesitant to share information. I also find that sometimes when I walk into a locker room where guys are just a bit unsure and feel like they have to put their guard up and I'm like, I'm around the same age as you, or we can connect on different levels and we have a lot in common. Just, you know, let's have a conversation. So I think those are some of the barriers that I still am trying to break down. Shifting to the uh, the dynamic of being a sideline reporter, um, I feel like the, it's one of those like fascinating kind of unique jobs in the sports world. Are there challenges to that that we might not see or notice if you know you're seeing on TV? It's like okay, time for the sideline reporter hit. Well, you know, just take us inside that world a little bit. Well, I mean, the biggest difficulty, and I think the one that's specifically unique to hockey is just the time constraints. It is the fastest sport with the least amount of breaks. Um, and it's just my biggest fear is talking over game action. And so when I'm asking questions to guys, my philosophy has always been open, lean, and neutral, um, especially for the coaches' interviews in the middle of the game. I don't need to assert my knowledge and say, this is how smart I am. I'm going to give you an observation. Do you agree with me and, and confirm how smart I am? I'm just a vehicle to get their opinion. So I'll often ask them a question 
what do you what do you make of the first period? And I sometimes see people say, oh, Emily Kaplan has such dumb questions. It's like, well, they're actually kind of dumb by design. And I have to humble myself in that way um, because the open, lean, and neutral questions actually gets their opinions and how they feel. And then the key there is to follow up in the smart way to dig for more details. And then just as for those time constraints, you know, I came up at Sports Illustrated where I was a staff writer and I wrote five, 6,000 word stories and I could paint a complete full picture with a ton of nuance. And, and that's, you know, what I took pride in. And now I'll sometimes get 20 seconds, if that, to give a report. Um, because I have a writing background, I think I've become a really good self-editor and I have to think about being very economical with my words. But it really frustrates me when I'm like, this is such a rich and compelling story and I have to distill it down. And oh my goodness, they're about to drop the puck for the linesman and I just need to wrap this up really quickly because if I'm talking over a goal, like I just need to get out of the way because all the viewer is here for is the game. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be tricky. Yeah, and like if you're watching a baseball game, like sometimes the sideline and reporter will say like, oh, and like that guy just grinded out, like back to my thing. Like exactly. you don't really have that, NFL, that space in that game. so much time, all the time in the world. Yeah. Uh, um, are there physical challenges too to like, you know, get get on, you know, on the bench or like wherever you need to be or like, you know, someone's like passing you with a beer or something? Does that come up as well? Um, I think people underestimate the way I walk on the ice or climb over boards. I'm always being offered help. And I'm like, I'm good. I've got this. I'm five foot two. And even if I do wear heels, like I, I can manage my way around. Um, there were, you know, when we covered in games at TD Garden, my position, we had to kind of climb over fans. And I think it was my light guy actually knocked over some beers. So we felt bad for them and we sent them a, a couple more. Um, but other than that, you know, it's just mainly just getting from A to B in an arena. Um, and, you know, I, I put in a ton of steps in an arena. I'll say that. And even if I feel a little lazy during the day, I always hit 10K at the end of a game night. Yeah, there you go. Um, let's get to these NHL playoffs. So we're recording at the beginning of the semifinals. What's been the big story for you for the, these playoffs? Well, the first round was defined by all these incredible comebacks that no lead was safe. Um, you know, and then the second round, it was kind of like no team is safe because the big, you know, teams that we had expected to make such noise, specifically the Boston Bruins who broke a ton of uh, history in the first round were eliminated. You know, we pride ourselves in hockey for having the most entertaining playoffs in all of sports. Um, the parody is something that Gary Bettman, the commissioner takes a lot of pride in. Um, and that has definitely never been more on display than now where it really feels like any team can win. Um, you know, here we're in the conference finals and it's for Sunbelt teams, right? It's all teams in warm weather areas. And that was a hallmark of Gary Bettman's NHL. So we're celebrating all of these different markets. We're celebrating all of these different teams and players. You know, we're at a point now where the highest paid players in the league have all been eliminated. So we're seeing true teams emerge. Um, I've given you five to six different storylines, which just shows you how compelling these playoffs have been. Yeah, I feel like the NHL playoffs, I mean, this is probably speaking to my own biases as, you know, someone who grew up like pretty obsessed with hockey. Um, but like, I feel like they have this unique blend of being like any team can win the number eight Florida Panthers can knock off the, like one of the most successful regular season teams in history, but it doesn't feel arbitrary. Like with March madness. Yes. Any team can win because it's just like one game and you know, someone can miss a crucial shot and that's, you know, that's the game. Uh, whereas in a seven game NHL playoff series, it feels like the best team of those seven games emerges and um, and and so yeah, if the Panthers win the cup, um, it won't feel like well that that was just like a total fluke where you know this goal bounced in and like this guy whatever this penalty was was bad or something. It feels like even if you weren't the best team of the regular season, you were the best team of the playoffs. No, it's so true, and I think. One of the greatest things about hockey is that it is the ultimate team sport. I think in some ways it does hold us back um, from a sports business standpoint because we see the way the NBA and the NFL grew. Um, we created characters and narratives around star players. Well, in the NHL, if you're a star player, if you're Connor McDavid, the best player in the world, you're only playing a third of the game, if that. Um, so you're really dependent more on your teammates, on your system, on coaching and adjustments. And because of that, I think you're right. When you get to the playoffs, it really is the best team that wins. And even though it can seem random, we can always dissect it and find the reasons that those certain teams emerge and certain teams don't. 
Yeah. And do you feel like hockey media has has changed, evolved over over your time in it? Or is it, you know, still kind of same old stuff? Uh, no, I think it's constantly evolving. I think the sport is growing. You know, the mantra in our game is always grow the game, grow the game. But it is. We're seeing more voices in hockey media, people with different entry points to the game um, and therefore different perspectives, which I think is great. Um we're seeing incredible increase in female viewership at ESPN and at ESPN.com, our readers. And I think that's fantastic. And I think, you know, it's largely been an inaccessible sport and now it's becoming slowly more and more accessible to people. Um, you know, we, we still have a long ways to go. So I'm proud of the way that hockey is evolving. I do feel in a lot of ways, it does feel a step behind or two from the NBA, this, you know, the sport that we share the same season with, but we're growing, um, you know, and the other aspect of it is hockey players, you know, they don't put their personality out there. As I said, you know, it's not really personality based. So the tick that some hockey players have is they don't even use the pronoun I. They say we or you instead of it. It's, it's weird tick that once you notice it, they're very deferential. And I think once the Generation Z and the younger players who have come up in a different generation are more comfortable flexing their personality, making it a bit about themselves, that'll open up hockey media as well because it shows more that we can do to give access to fans to create those, you know, connectivity and storylines that'll make them care more. Yeah, I feel like the great running gag of like through the decades of hockey is like someone can like, you know, steal a puck by himself, like twirl around five different players and score a goal. You'll ask him about that and be like, yeah, you know, like the, the, our guy made a great save and like we were just been grinding the whole game and I just got got lucky on that one. Correct. Um, As someone yeah. who asks these guys questions in games, I can confirm that is true. <laughs> yeah. Um, where do you see that or why do you see that growth happening, uh, especially among women fans? Um, I think it begins firstly at a grassroots level. I mean, it was not long ago, 15, 20 years ago, where if women wanted to play the sport, the only options were boys teams. And now girls hockey was one of the fastest growing sports in America. I still think it still it is now that pickleball has just totally smashed everything. I think we probably have to recheck those stats. Um, but more women just getting entry points to playing the game, I think has been huge. College hockey, um, you know, women's professional hockey, they still need a sustainable league. Um, but the amount of great women athletes that are coming up has been great. Um, and just in general, I think, you know, in the way we broadcast the game, we're, we're very focused, you know, ESPN's a Disney company and it's all about storytelling and narratives. And I do think that some of those elements that we've been adding to the game coverage of, you know, creating that connectivity with fans um, and specifically female fans who, you know, do love stories and, and stories around games and want to care. Why do I care about this player? What am I watching? Um, I think that's helped as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Before you go, uh, let's get a, if I can get a, a cup pick out of you who, who's taken home the Stanley Cup? Oh, well, every prediction I've made so far has like gone completely bonkers. Uh, so, you know, the four teams remaining are, are four excellent teams. Um, I do have Vegas beating the Dallas Stars in seven games in the Western Conference Final. And I think the Carolina Hurricanes are finally going to take down those plucky Florida Panthers who just won't go away. Um, I think it's Vegas' time. You know, I, I love Raleigh. I love what they built with the Carolina Hurricanes. It's become one of the best fan bases in sports. But uh, Vegas, ever since they entered the league, they've become extremely impatient to win. They've been pretty ruthless about it. Um, and they're just operating at a great level right now that if their goaltending holds up, um, I think it's theirs. All right. Emily Kaplan, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That's it for today. Drop us a rating on your podcast app or just give me a shout on Twitter at Owen Poindexter. Let me know what you think of the show. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.